This is the way I do cut-ups. I don't know if it's like the way Brian Kyson does his or, or Barrows does his. I don't know. But this is the way I do them. I've used this method only on a couple of actual songs. What I've used it for more than anything else is igniting anything that might be in my imagination. I mean, it can often come up with very interesting uh, attitudes to look into. I don't know. Anyway, let's see what happens. Hello, welcome, welcome, welcome. We're on uh, we're on episode nine of the Dr. Caligari vlogs. Um, today, I want to think about um, maybe something more critically reflective about the process that we're on, uh, rather than just sharing the process with you. And um, to help me do this, I've been um, talking to. Stop it. I've been talking to. Hey, I've been <laughs> I've been talking to a um, a doctor a friend of mine. Uh, she's a doctor of dogology. Um, she received her very prestigious PhD uh, from onlinedoctorates.co.uk.org.dog. Um, and uh, I mean, she bought, which well, didn't buy it. Uh, that's probably been a little bit. I mean, she had to hack into the site first. Um, but she's very good uh, at helping me think, so I've, I've asked uh, Dr. Millicent Moo to come and meet me today. So this is Dr. Millicent Moo. Hello, Dr. Moo. Um, I, I'm trying to think more critically about the work I'm doing, and I wondered if you could help me in terms of thinking. Have you got any tips for critical thinking? No. Okay. Have have you have you got any advice that you could give me in terms of maybe what you're thinking now? Okay. So you're thinking about choices. Apparently, it's all about the kind of choices that you make. Um, what are you? What choices would you would you could you share with us that you're making now? Okay, so that's a choice between the merits of rolling in cowpat compared to the merits of rolling in fox poo. That's very helpful. Thank you very much. So I've been thinking about uh, the process I'm involved in and the most difficult part of this process, for me anyway, is trying to shake off all those years of psychological realism, the training that I've had, the way I've worked, um, asking those psychological realism questions all the time of, you know, what do I want? What am I trying to do to get what I want? What's my, you know, what are my objectives? How, you know, how do I create a character that's believe? Trying to stop that and think in, in different ways. And that's quite, that's, that's been quite uh, difficult. Um, so I've, I've scribbled down some ideas that I've been using to try and antidote my own ways of thinking, to try and short circuit the overwhelming desire to create psychological realism. Um, and some of the things that I've done in this process so far to do that, first of all, is, is to start with physicalization and to start often with a kind of abstract physicalization that's based in an emotion or a feeling or just a physical sensation rather than anything else and, and work out from that um, to try and avoid imposing a kind of a, a trajectory that is under, that is realistic. The second thing that we've been doing in rehearsals is, is quite simply just copying without working it from the inside so we will we'll have video from say Vertigo and we'll just copy the moves and actions or the the rate at which those people speak and then and then impose as a layer that on the work that we're doing so that the movements and the the rates of speaking even if the text changes and the way that people speak 
So we've done some work on, for example, uh, the Hitchcock blonde accent. Uh, I can share that with you now. Here, you better have some, or, or perhaps you'd like a drink. I fell into the bay and you fished me out. That's right. The lips. And when she goes to do something that's rounded, is it? Or is it? Oh, you like it too. It's like, she's quite pouty, isn't she? So when you're rounding, when you're saying goose, you don't want goose, you want a goose. Yes. He sounds. Which sounds do you recognize from your kit list? Oh? Yes, O yes, isn't quite the same, because RP would be O, and she says more like O, O. Oh, really? Most monothongs, in fact, I think all of the monothongs, apart from a couple, are exactly the same. And I, so it kind of rounds a little bit. Um, trap is the same, but do you know the two dots? Have you learned the two dots over a, a phoneme? Remind us. <laughs> it means just centralised. So it's exactly as you would make trap, trap, but you're bringing it back towards the midline, so it's more like... Tre. 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 Yes. So it's RP, but it's a little bit more central. Tre. And then bar, she is not really consistent in this. And I think transatlantic in general, they're not. Yeah. So you can have bar, and you can also have bear. Bear. So it can be like bear. Bear. We've also, uh, apart from that copying, um, Within a scene, I've started trying to shift the character from person to person without saying, maybe only for a line or two, so somebody's dealing with it and then it shifts character and then goes back, so, so that you lose a kind of sense of creating a continuity of thought or, or a continuity of behaviours. Um, the fourth one is cut-ups, really, which is something that David Bowie used to do lots of his songs. Um, now these experiments started not on tape recorders, but on paper. In 1959, Brian Geisen said that writing is 50 years behind painting and applied the montage technique to words on a page. And this technique had already been used in painting at that time for 50 years. It was, in fact, kind of old hat in painting. Brian copied out phrases from newspapers and magazines, then took a scissors and cut these selections into pieces and rearranged the fragments at random. And these cut-up experiments appeared in Minutes to Go in 1959. Uh, when you experiment with cut-ups over a period of time, you find that some of the cut-ups and rearranged texts seem to refer to future events. I cut up an article on, uh, written by John Paul Getty and got, It's a bad thing to sue your own father. This was a rearrangement and wasn't in the original text. And a year later, one of his sons did sue him. Uh, we had no explanation for this at the time, and just uh, suggesting the press when you cut into the present, the future leaks out. And if you think about it, this play that we're doing, based on the cabinet of Dr. Caligari, it's nearly a hundred years old. When we look back at this, we can't help, our view of this play cannot help but be infected by all the other pieces of art that the cabinet of Dr. Caligari has in itself influenced over the years, and we see it, we see it through those um, influences. So what I'm trying to do is to allow those influences to infect the piece that I'm creating now, like a virus, or even possess it sometimes. So, um, like, I've got Hitchcock movies and Vertigo, the way Hitchcock works, and The Matrix, so I've got films, I've got 1984 as a novel, I've even got Dante's Inferno, which predates, obviously, but it sort of casts shadows. All these things seem to me to cast shadows from the past towards the present, but also as we look from the present towards the past, we see through the sort of shades and shadows of the works of art. Um, so I want to give in to these shadows, um, give in to the echoes and let them take over. Sometimes it's like they come and they kind of, they elbow the scene out the way and they say, we want to play. The one area that I've not tried yet that I think I might like to try is by using artworks. So specifically the works of Kandinsky uh, and see if, if, if those abstract pieces he created, which were so influential uh, in the creation of um, expressionist 
uh, the expressionist movement see, to see if they might give us some insight. I might look at that. Um, the way the cut-ups has worked for us are in that I've taken a lot of some of these sources that I've just spoken about and just literally cut them up and thrown them in the air, see where they land, and then see if they try and they, they tell a story. And they do. They, they do tell their own story. Um, one thing that I wanted to do, a specific example, would be um, the character Cesare, who is the sleepwalker, the somnambulist, and he's kept trapped within a coffin-like cabinet. So his existence is a sort of in this trapped sleep world that's like a living death. And is he asleep? Is he dead? It, it, it. I wanted to get inside of that. So I wanted him to have a speech or specifically some kind of music piece, a song even, where, where we got inside expressing what that feeling might be. Um, and so I thought about Hamlet because Hamlet's all about, you know, living inside a confined space and pondering the merits of life, death and sleep and dreams and nightmares. Um, so literally we, we took one of Hamlet's speeches, we cut it up into pieces, myself and the actor playing Cesare. Cesare threw it on the floor and moved it around and, and, and saw what came out and we, we got a different kind of quite sort of savage and scary um, story or, that came through quite a different piece of poetry. Two, and, and it, two great, one great phrase came out from everything which was dream shocks, the dream shocks. Um, uh, which I particularly like. So it's starting to be a, a play about shadows and dream shocks. Thank you. We're in Los Angeles in 74, whatever it was. Um, you were still using that technique of cut-ups. Do you still use it or do you do? Yeah, yeah, um, increasingly so, to a great extent on outside. Uh, even say on the new album, Earthling, if you put three or four disassociated ideas together, um, and created awkward relationships with them. The, the unconscious intelligence that comes from that, those pairings um, is really quite startling sometimes, quite, quite, quite provocative. A friend of mine in San Francisco developed a program for me on the computer, which enables me to do it really quickly. So instead of going to the laborious process instead of cutting, cutting things up, you yeah. use your computer. Yeah, and you can and you can work with far more material. So I'll take articles out of newspapers, uh, poems that I've written, pieces of other people's books, um, and put them all into this little warehouse of, of this container of of information, and then hit hit the pro uh, the the random button, and it'll randomise everything, and I'll get reams of papers back out of it with uh, interesting ideas. And then I'll either take sentences verbatim as it, as it spews them out, or there might be something within a sentence which triggers off an idea. To die. 